Okay, so to um, go back to what I was saying earlier, um, I'm going to sh show a brief example of what an authentic assessment might look like. In my personal situation, in courses that I teach, commonly revolve around Laulima. So this particular example is of a uh, Laulima workshop for designing online courses uh, using the Laulima lessons tool. Specifically, um, this assessment, this authentic assessment, would be for the participant to demonstrate their learning of the parts that go into a Lao Lima lesson, okay? So in this example, um, I thought I'd give you both a traditional versus an authentic. So a traditional way you might assess this uh, would be a quiz, a Lao Lima quiz with true or false. And the question might look like this. A Lao Lima lesson introduction should be brief, appeal to your audience, and introduce the relevance of the lesson topic, true, false. And then the participant would select true or false. Um, the drawbacks, though, is that this type of an assessment, it's kind of giving them, number one, a clue to what the answer is. And two, it's kind of just measuring whether they generally agree. Like, we've all been there. You read the question and you're like, well, for the most part, that sounds true. So you click on true. And then they try to get you by putting in, you know, small little distractors in there. But for the most part, this type of uh, assessment question gives the learner a clue. And in general, you're just testing that, yeah, they vaguely kind of knew what it is. And yeah, they agree. It says it's true. So that's the traditional approach. Um, an authentic approach to that same objective might be something like this. Compose a week one introduction to your Laulima development site week one lesson. So in this example, uh, they would actually be working in a Laulima development site. So it's real world. It's actually the actual software. And they're developing um, their, in this case, Laulima introduction. And in the, and in the um, action of developing that introduction, they're demonstrating all of the things that they would have normally been assessed on such as they understand what the parts of the introduction are. It should be brief uh, and it should be, it should explain the relevancy uh, to the lesson. So how do you measure that? Well, that is one of the points about authentic assessment versus, you know, a traditional assessment. Traditional assessments tend to be a little quicker and more efficient to grade because they're, they have standardized answers. And so you can even sometimes have a LMS such as Lao Lima score the student submissions uh, versus an authentic assessment, which might not directly have a specific correct answer uh, because it's unique to each student. So in those situations, you would want a rubric. So then I have an example here. Oh, sorry, let me clear those annotations off the screen. There you go. I have an example here of what that rubric might look like. So a rubric might look like something like this, and you would want a rubric for an authentic assessment because it will um, improve the efficiency of your grading of the authentic assessment. Again, because authentic assessments, uh, the answers or the student submissions of work aren't a standardized, you know, canned answer, and they can have some variation to their work. So you'd want a rubric, something like this. In this particular, there are many ways to do rubrics, and I should emphasize that this is just one example of a type of rubric. Um, in this particular one, there are three levels of proficiency. Developing would be um, the student's work is not quite there to show that they've met the uh, criteria for proficiency for this activity. Meets proficiency would be that they're, they've done everything that they need to to demonstrate that they understood the concept and then exceeds proficiency. So there's some examples of that and how you might word the different levels. So in that, let's just go through that first row. The first row, it says the lesson introduction lacks detail, is unclear, or is not written to the st in student-friendly language. So it's, it shows it's written in a way where it's developing. Then your middle criteria meets proficiency. Basically, it's straightforward. Uh, the lesson introduction is brief. It's clearly written, and it's in student-friendly language. And then in this example, exceeding proficiency would be the criteria for the meets proficiency, 
but a little more, right? It exceeds. So in this particular one, I added on uh, that the writing style reflects the culture of our student population. So you can see that they've met the criteria for the assignment, the authentic assignment, but perhaps in this example, they've exceeded it by customizing it and tailoring it to our audience. So that's a gist of how you could write a rubric. And again, the rubrics are really helpful in scoring an authentic assessment. So there are many other examples of authentic assessments. Uh, and these are uh, a few of them. Uh, presentations, demonstrations, projects, again, real world hardware and software. Um, the examples of um, that I had given just previously with Laulima, that would be considered a software. So by having the participants using Laulima, they're using the actual software. Um, let me go through them. I kind of highlighted a few of the main points and benefits to the different examples here, but feel free to unmute and chime in if um, you've had experience and can bring up any uh, stronger examples of why you might wanna do some of these examples. So for presentations and demonstrations, it's authentic because it's a kinesthetic, meaning that they're standing up and presenting or they're presenting through Zoom like I am right now, but it's a kinesthetic. They're reinforcing their learning in their mind through a presentation, whether it be a recorded video screencast or um, a live Zoom cast like this or in the classroom. Or in the case of a demonstration, they're rehearsing their knowledge. So they've learned something, they've learned a concept, but they're demonstrating it and they're going through the motions and they're rehearsing their knowledge. So it's reinforcing what they've learned, right? For our projects, uh, again, uh, Laulima would be an example of the actual real software, uh, but other examples might be like Microsoft Excel or, or a CAD program, or if you had a, another scientific program for graphing, you know, they're using actual software. And in the case of hardware, Don, like photography, um, an authentic assessment will be, you know, take a specific type of picture. Okay, the fact that they took the picture tells you that they know how to use the equipment and do the adjustments to take that type of a picture. Uh, Game-based activities. The competitive nature of a game helps to reinforce their learning because the ones that have got the concept will perform better on the game. But also the game, it will bring in real-world variables. So that's kind of what makes it a fun learning game is it's bringing in some of the variables that apply to that particular topic, whatever the subject is um, that you're teaching. For mock interviews and role playing, those types of uh, authentic assessments really leverage giving your students a, a diverse or a different perspective of the problem. So like in the case of mock interviews, it, you know, whether you're the prosecutor, the, the defender or the judge, um, by putting students in those different roles, they're forced to apply the knowledge that they've learned and, and per, apply it from, the pers from different perspectives to get a under better understanding of what they've learned. And they've also uh, obviously demonstrate the, the learning um, because in order to be a, have a successful role play, you need to kind of know your, your boundaries and variables there. Uh, portfolios of work, it's relatively straightforward. Portfolios would be a collection of artifacts um, or evidence that students have been working towards and can demonstrate um, specific skills or knowledge. Debate and uh, discussion would demonstrate the student's depth of learning and their fluency of understanding what they've learned because, you know, in a, in a debate things go by quickly. And if, and if you don't know a response, then you're not gonna do well in the debate or it will clearly be shown to the um, instructor. So debate and discussion are fun for the student. And it also demonstrates their fluency uh, and understanding. And then lastly, a reflective writing and self-assessment. Um, Self-analysis, thinking about, thinking critically about the subject that they've learned also helps them to reinforce the knowledge because in order to write out um, or respond to your written assignment, they have to think about what they learned and organize it and present it in a, in a document. Are there any other examples that 
um, I've missed here or or supporting thoughts that anyone would like to share? Um, do you have an example of a of a game? Of a game? Yes. Well, I was thinking of one. Um, I don't have any games for course design, so you know I don't necessarily do any course games for course design. So subject matter, you have to forgive me on that. But a, a game that I've played in the past for um, Quizlet Live. If you're familiar with Quizlet, you're putting in um, sort of terms and definitions. And what happens is the Quizlet Live will divide up your class into, for example, two teams. So you, you need to have a minimum of four, I believe, students. They'll join the Quizlet Live session. Quizlet software will split them into two teams, right? But each team will get the same set of questions. But the kicker is that it's obviously a web-based, so everyone needs their own device. The kicker is that each of us in the group will get, you know, a specific set of questions or a specific set of answers. And we have to work as a group to figure out within our group who's got the correct answer. And then someone for on behalf of our group will submit the answer. And it's a competition between two groups. So Blanca, if you and I are on the same team, you'll get some answers and I'll get some answers. We'll both get the same question and you and I have to discuss which is which, who's got the right answer and then we'll submit it. And then it's okay. a competition between the two teams uh, to who can get to the all the questions answered first. But the kicker also is that if we get it wrong, we get sent back to the very first question and we have to respond. <laughs> So I have. I, I actually played with my students, but I played um, Jeopardy. Oh. Uh, long time ago. But what do you do with the team that loses? Do they? Do you consider that they are not good, or or is it? How, how do you go about that? That's that's mostly how 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 you know the question. Right. How well, do you do with the not the non winners? Or the ones that are at the end, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it depends. There's formative and summative. If it's a formative learning activity, it's a little bit more forgiving. Um, Jane, I see your hand up. Do you, do you have something to contribute? Yeah, I, well, I remember, Corey, I don't play any games, but Corey Adler, for I think it's for um, stratification and sociology, she got a bunch of Monopoly boards, and then she has students play uh, into groups in Monopoly, but she doesn't divide the money equally. So she's like, some people are like really rich, some people are men, some people are like poor and on welfare. And like, so then she gives them all these varying amounts based on whatever their their social label is and then they have to play monopoly and then at the end see right how like how like how much you know who has the most property who's who's doing well you know who can get out of jail all of these kinds of things and then that's how she demonstrates social stratification in society so i'm assuming that would be considered an authentic assessment or that sounds that sounds fantastic yeah that does and also um, i was reminded of simulation games too so they're games, but then they're actually like Jane mentioned, the variables within the game model or are paralleled in real life. I used to, this was when I was in the classroom, um, in my lifespan development course, I had them, their final project was in groups. They made a board game based on our, our, um, material right it had to be like a lifespan so they had to start from like prenatal development all the way to death um and so they had some liberty as to what they could do they just had to include like each uh, part along the way and um and then they then our final like the final day was we came and they like traded and they played each other's games in their groups it was cool but i couldn't think of a there's i haven't been able to replicate it online but it was a good one for in person nice Well, thank you, everybody, for sharing. Those are really good examples. On this particular slide, we're just comparing and contrasting authentic assessment versus traditional assessment. So previously, when I was describing the game that I do with uh, Quizlet Live, 
you know, that's a game and it's a fun learning game, but it might not be authentic assessment as much as what Jane shared, which in that particular game, you know, it modeled parallel real world variables. Well, here in, um, in this slide, these are some of the other differences between subtle differences between authentic assessments and on the left and traditional standardized assessments on the right. So first of all, authentic assessments are typically flexible and the ways that um, you can apply learning, they're diversified and differentiated. So it's not always gonna be take a quiz at the end of the week. You might have some of these different games or in this case, portfolios or hands-on projects to do versus a standardized quiz approach uh, would be take the quiz at the end of the week and it's multiple choice or true false. For authentic assessment, uh, students apply skills and knowledge to real world situations versus on traditional side, oftentimes it's just they're showing that they can memorize and recall the answers. And then on the left, assessment occurs through course activities and instruction versus on the right, teaching the subject and then just straight testing it. These are some of the pros and cons of authentic assessment. Um, on the left, it prepares students for uh, with work life skills that they can apply in the real world. Um, it provides a variety of ways of demonstrating learning. So another branch of this would be differentiated learning where you give students choice in the way that they demonstrate it. Um, so if you really get into authentic assessment, you might find yourself offering those choices to students too. Um, in general, authentic assessments are comprehensive. So um, in a, Traditional exam, true, false, you know, you don't really see their thinking. You just know that they chose either true or false. But typically in an authentic assessment, um, like in the case of the game, they're in their mind when they're responding, they're analyzing a bunch of different variables uh, to apply to come up with the answer. So it's demonstrating a more comprehensive um, thinking process usually. And then in general, they're a little bit more engaging than uh, your your typical traditional standardized assessment. But I added this bullet to the bottom because we're talking about authentic assessment, but traditional assessment has its place as well. We're not looking for you to change all of your assessments to be authentic assessment. We do recognize, you know, as Blanca mentioned, there are times when formative assessment or simple reviews um, and traditional assessments um, fit the bill and you should still use those. So just consider implementing a mix of them. You know, maybe um, for your summative assessment at the end, it's an authentic assessment. But some of your formative assessments during the learning process, maybe they're traditional. So we're not to say, you know, one or the other, but you might end up with a mix. So next I would like to um, open the floor to our two guest presenters. We're very appreciative to have them. They were referred to me as all stars in authentic assessment. <laughs> so I'm very appreciative that they had time to uh, spend with us today. So um, Anushka Fauci, um, doctor, um, who's a lecturer for our math and science division, and Reina Ujiri, who is an assistant professor in our math and science division. Uh, we didn't discuss who's going to go first and second. Um, so I'll let them decide. <laughs> Whatever, <laughs> doesn't matter to me. Anushka, maybe since you spoke first, you can go first. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Got it. Um, let me share. Um, wait. Sorry. That's when you mostly teach online asynchronous. You're struggling with these things. All right, so I use a lot of, well, I think I use a lot of authentic assessments in different ways, mostly because I teach a lot of um, bio labs, which automatically I think just naturally are hands-on and um, not a lot of standardized, but it's a lot of more like I would say traditional, um, like lab reports and essays and, you know, things like that. Today, I thought I will um, share 
two examples which um, I just started doing in the last two years with this whole online thing. And I think you could, um, though I have examples in biology, I think you could adjust them to any other subject or topic. Um, both are kind of, sorry, I should, both are kind of like science communication or like anything communication thing. I think maybe um, the whole beginning of COVID, I realized there was a lot of communication issues I felt, which created some um, issues throughout society. I thought, okay, let's focus on helping them being concise and getting their point across. So that was kind of the, the idea. So one is um basically replacing both kind of replace a like kind of a longer formal lab report or semester long essay um i was struggling with those for intro level bio courses because i often feel they're they're lacking the their research skills and the general topic skills to do really well thought out um longer things often because they don't actually um collect the data or not as much or don't understand. So it's often, I think it's hard for the students and me. And I felt they were a little bit um, not getting where what you wanted them to do by them applying all the concepts they learned and, and communicating them. So this first one is like it's a science communication project using Padlet. And you can use it. I've used it in different class in like bio intro for majors. I use like they could choose a bio top, a bio, a topic in biology could be anything. Um, and then in zoology and marine biology, I use them for like just they do a portrait of their choice of organism or animal. And they have to choose, so they choose their topic or organism. They choose um, the format. It cannot be a traditional essay or PowerPoint presentation. It has to be uh, something else, like for a more general audience, so an infographic, a video, a blog, a website. I'm pretty open. They can talk to me, whatever they want, whatever there's, you know, some are really good with videos. I mean, some are pretty amazing with these things. They have to choose an audience. It cannot be the students of this class or my teacher. It has to be, it could be children. It could be a school. It could be, you know, people I had students do like a leaflet on a Hawaiian plant. They're like the audience, whoever goes to the garden center. Right, like those are kind of the, the ideas. Um, and then I do everything on Padlet. Um, I guess here the student learning outcome. So kind of a little bit of research skills and presentation skills, but also kind of evaluate the information they kind of learn throughout and try to put it in a concise way. Um, so they have to kind of really digest the information um, and just improve communication skills. So. This is a, just a screenshot from the Padlets. I use it also for the, the class introductions. And then I use this in synchronous and asynchronous online classes. Um, so you can just set it up basically instead of a discussion board, I use column is so a different column per um, what it is part. And it's like a semester long thing. So they introduce themselves and then they, pro they provide the project idea, give them the prompt and they just add on and they have to respond like, you know, the next week. I know the grading is a little tricky. What I do is when I transferred, when I have rubrics on La Lima, and then when I grade it, I just click the heart. So I know I, I included in the grade book. Um, and comments, thankfully, it tells you when, so which days. So if you just know you do it like, you know, every two, three days, you look at them. So it helps you to make sure what you transfer to La Lima. And then I'll do the project draft and then the final project. Um, the, if, it was a synchronous class. I had them do elevator speeches, which is actually something in science more and more, or it's important, right? What what do you do? What do you work about? To be able to say what you do in like one to two minutes. So that was pretty impressive. Um, yeah, so this is that. And I have to say some of the projects have really impressed me. I remember I think especially that first or second semester during COVID, you know, when some students were dropping off on not submitting ass assignments or they're not good quality, but they put a lot of time in this. So some students really surprised me. Um, and some of them videos or so, I asked the students if I could use them for my other classes. Like they had like some intro marine bio topics, which I ended up using for my lesson pages in my marine bio class. So that's one. And sorry, uh, Brent, I didn't check the clocks. So I don't know. Um, the other thing I started, like Alyssa uh, McDonald started using, is Wikipedia assignments. 
And how that came about is I have marine bio students, I want them to learn more some common marine species in Hawaii. And they have, they occur in different types of um, assignments. But I noticed that they would include a lot of Mediterranean species. And I was like, why are you including these species which don't even occur in Hawaii? Till I realized that they're just underrepresented in Wikipedia and just online in general. So I remember that there is like some teachers are still telling me about Wikipedia assignments. So Wikipedia has actually a whole education side and they have a whole support team and a platform. I'll show you guys in a minute. minute. Um, and you can ask, you can basically apply to be part of it. And then it's just an online form you say, and then you just, it's like a separate Laulima site. You just, I then just link to Laulima. Um, so this one replaced basically kind of a longer, also semester long assignment. And they get some training on plagiarism and, um, you know, be right objectively and concisely, which students offer struggle in the sciences. Um, they're used to just try to say the same thing in five sentences from how they feel about it. I'm like, no, that's not what I want. I want, you know, facts. Um, I want reference facts based on good quality resources. And so the Wikipedia website um, has some trainings on those parts and how to add citations and how to choose what's a good quality resource and what's not, um, things like that. And then they just basically add, and it's minimal, it's just like five to 10, I asked them five to 10 sentences to so add to a current page which has like one sentence on a species or sometimes I start the page if I, if that species does not have a page yet. Um, for example, Limu Kala, which is um, known Hawaiian, whatever, never had a page till this semester. Um, so I just started and I asked them to do five to 10 sentences well-written with at least five additional references than what's already in the article. So it's not pages, right? It's just, minimal um anyway these are the so this is the dashboard so basically you get a dashboard you can set up you submit what you want to do it for um you can put down a timeline when different trainings are when there's building like when there's drafts um i sometimes have certain things over in lao lima um it can also there's a built-in peer review like you can it just shuffles the students one my, like minor thing is students have to sign into it to get access and then they can act then can access everything on the dashboard and you just have to transfer of course the the things i give them like minor points for just doing all the exercises and the trainings and then i do the the drafts and peer review and um the final article over in la lima um but it's been I have to say it's been really rewarding one to know that the class adds to the the knowledge you know in like in the world um but then also the students it takes them a while so so students draft in what's called the sandbox it's basically a it's like a wikipedia page but it's hidden from anybody else like other than the student and me um I had students they were telling me um Oh my, I submitted it, I did everything, but it disappeared. So what happened is they didn't draft in the sandbox. They put it in the real article and it wasn't well written English. <laughs> and some Wikipedian came in and just said, nope, reworks to the old version. So those things happened a few times and they realized that they need to, they need to up their game. They can't just submit something. So they, quite a few and so there's a built-in reflective essay at the end and a lot of students realized that was their take home is like oh this is the world is watching so I better you know up the quality of my work and so I thought that was um pretty cool um out of um, benefit for faculty they have a program you can have a mentor so somebody else who so I had a professor from um Toronto who helped me the first semester kind of why I was doing that so there was kind of built-in um, things yeah that's my example thank you Anushka 
wow, I don't know if I want to follow up after that, but that was amazing. Um, let me, so I'm going to put in chat a link if you are interested in the project that I'm going to share about. Sorry. So I actually incorporate projects into all of the classes I teach, but I'm going to highlight the Math 100 course. Um, just because Math 100 has students who are interested in such a wide gamut of professions, and you know, you always get, why am I learning this in this class? Why am I even taking this math class? Right? I don't really need it if I'm going into, you know, digital media. I don't, you know, if I'm going to be an artist, I don't think I need math. I, mean, I get that a lot. And of course, for a math class, our outcomes are super technical, right? When you look at these, can they mathematically model? You know, can they analyze limitations to equations or calculations or different scenarios? Can they actually apply what they're learning? Right? Is it just, can they just see a formula and plug in numbers or do you want them to extend that into what they, they see and experience in the real world? So in the Math 100 course, we have a term project. Um, this is a common project that multiple instructors use. So it is very broad. Um, it's broken up into five different parts throughout the term so students can work on individual pieces instead of you know, submitting one huge project at the end because of the calculations that are required for the project. Right? If calculations are incorrect, when they try to do an analysis of their results, you can't have accurate analysis if you have incorrect calculations. And because this project is a common project that multiple instructors use, the rubrics are very general and broad. And um, in that link I shared in the chat, you can actually see the rubrics that are included and you know the directions for the project. But most importantly, students are given that opportunity to really apply what they're learning to, to something outside of the classroom. And this project itself focuses mainly on savings and retirement. It's really hard with the, with the project because we have, you know, I have early college students, right, who are still living at home, who um, you know, haven't had a savings account yet, you know, whereas other of their classmates might have a job, they're earning income already. Um, I have returning students who were in a profession but are coming back to school and wanting to you know, grow a little bit more. So the project itself has a lot of student choice, which on, on the upside, it gives students, you know, this is real, this is applicable to me, but a little bit harder on the instructor side because you have to kind of take the time to read through every student response, but you really get to know your students from their responses, you know, and. And you can share information if you notice things that they might not have shared with you in person, like, oh, you know, here are some resources if you need it. You know, I noticed you mentioned something in your project, you might need a little extra help at home type of thing. But each part of the component um, project has students reflect on their savings. In component one, the main idea is, hey, have you thought about saving? Right? And of course, like I said, early college students generally, nope haven't really thought about saving. They don't know what they're gonna do yet, right? Versus um, freshmen, right? Maybe they sort of have an idea, maybe they started working versus returning students or you know, military students, they have a nest egg already, right? They've built some of their savings already. They thought about what they need to do to save and how to get there. Okay. So this first component kind of gives students the gamut, right? If you haven't really thought about saving, here's some tips that maybe you can think about. Right? Research some tips on your own. And what do you think you can use for yourself? So it's it's super interesting to see. Some students will, will find web pages that are run the gamut. Okay, 
cut out Starbucks, right? Because that's here and now. Some students go to Starbucks every day. Hey, I can save $5 every single day if I just cut out Starbucks. And it's the little thing by the end, right? Every little thing to help you save will help you in the long term. The next part of the project has students think about their intended profession. What do they want to be when they actually graduate? And possibly where they might live when they do graduate, live and work. And it has them research information on the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. And though we have them you know, go to a specific website to research their profession and you know, annual wages, it's, it's almost impossible to find wage information for the entire world. So we do have to narrow it down a little bit for them. And some students have actually mentioned, oh, I, I do want to plan to move to a different country to work, which is awesome. But unfortunately, you know, to help narrow down their choices, if, if they do decide to move to a different country or move someplace where there's no wage um, statistics available, we just say, oh, use Hawaii for now, and then you can do more research later. And then they think about, okay, if I look a little bit more ahead, when might I want to retire? And what kind of lifestyle might I want to have? And of course, you get students thinking, okay, I'm going to retire at 35. Right? They haven't really thought that long ahead. They think 35 is old. Right? And then you have students who are thinking a little bit more long term, uh, 67, right, when I can start redeeming Social Security. Um, and some students will say, okay, I want to still work when I retire versus I'm just going to relax when I retire. So that it's students get the choice. And they get to kind of see, okay, depending on what choices I make, if I want to travel the world when I retire, how might this affect my lifestyle and how much I'm spending over time in relation to how much I should try to save for retirement, if that's ideally what I want to do. And then component three comes all the calculations. So they're using what all the information that they found based on their employment and statistics and retirement lifestyle and kind of applying it to a scenario where, hey, what would or could I save over, a, over my working life if, if I set my mind to it? Okay, so they're provided with a Google Sheet spreadsheet template where they fill in and they're supposed to do different scenarios. Okay, if I save maybe 10% of my income every month versus 15% of my income over time, how might that look for me? Do I think I could, you know, would that last me for retirement? Would it not last me for retirement? How do these different numbers affect what I could actually save? And this is what this spreadsheet looks like. So the first two columns here, scenario one and scenario two are required. And students who are kind of on the fence thinking about different professions or different places to live, you know, they can also do kind of what ifs. So sort of like how STAR, GPS, right? When you're registering for classes, what if I want to be going to culinary or what if I want to go into digital media or engineering? They have those different options. And this spreadsheet allows them to kind of see, okay, if I do change where I live or I change the profession, that also affects the annual wage and what might that look like over time. And then in component four, the students are actually looking at their calculations and trying to draw analysis based on that. And in this component, they think about, you know, would my savings actually last? Would, would I be able to live comfortably if I save a you know, million dollars by the time I retire, yes or no? What changes might they make? So say a student is ends up having a long-term savings of maybe $250,000 because they wanted to retire by the, by 30 years old. You know, they didn't haven't worked long enough to build up their savings. They might kind of realize, oh, I might have to end up working longer or I might have to change how my retirement lifestyle, maybe I can't be globetrotting anymore. Maybe, maybe one or two trips a year instead of 
constant traveling. Um, and then they also think about some of the limitations of this project, right? This is super straightforward. Okay, you think of a profession, you think of a state, you think about how much you want to save, but it doesn't include like inflation. Right? Inflation is the common ones. A lot of students will talk about inflation and how this um, project takes into account only current dollars, right? If you're making this much now right, and you invest the same amount over a long period of time, you're gonna get an amount in current dollars. It doesn't take into account you know, raises, job loss, family, if you have other investments, if you lose money from other investments, so students get to think about all of those other things that, you know, in a math project, ideally you would want them to try to test it out and see, okay, this might what be what happened. But for a Math 100 course, right, this is even hard for calculus students, trying to account for all of the different variables and real world scenarios. So in this part of the project, they get to think, okay, is this really realistic? This is like an ideal scenario where nothing changes, but that's really not how real life works. And what are some things in a real life that could affect you as, as you grow older? And then in the last part of the project, the majority of the students really like this part because they'll end up writing a letter. They could write a letter to their past selves, to their children, to their spouse. You know, what are some tips you would share? What did you learn from this whole project that you found valuable that you would want to share with somebody else? And you write a letter to them. Say, this is what I learned. You know, this is what I think you might want to try to do or apply in the future. Or this is what I wished I had learned when I first graduated high school and started working. Like this, this information would have been super helpful for me. And it's students like that, I found. They, they really like this, the the opportunity to have that flexibility and try things out. Um, yeah. Yes, it is a, a great summary of what they learned as well. I know we're 10 minutes, right? 149, I don't wanna take up too much time. So Brent, I'll, I'll turn it over to you again. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Anushka. Thank you, Reina. Um, very, very great examples of authentic assessment. And as I was like listening, a question came to my mind, and maybe I'll ask each of you this question, and if you could share, um, how long did it take you to come to this polished product so that our audience, you know, can have a feel for it? It doesn't have to be done like by spring, because uh, both of these are very comprehensive. So uh, if I could ask that of our two guest presenters to estimate. <laughs> I can start. I know I, I had an idea. Like once I knew I wanted to make the change, I just started and I kind of just like at the beginning and just made it up as long as I went, you know, the first time I taught it. And now, I, of course, I learned a few tips um, and I have them ready. But the first time I definitely just... I don't know, not long. Like it took me a while to think about it, but then set up the Padlet and find a rubric and go. <laughs> and then did you know the wiki, uh, the Ed wiki up front already, or did you find that? No, I found that and then I saw you could sign up to it. So I, I, I shared the link in the chat. Um, and then I also, I think you automatically got an email if I want to have a mentor, I'm like, yes. <laughs> And, and then that helped. And I made a few changes through the, through the years, but I think even the first semester, you know, it, it, you learn, I think Alyssa and me both didn't understand the peer review thingy. So we made this complicated Google sheet, but then we're like, no, it's all set in place already. Um, yeah, so it was actually not too bad. Um, I know now a little pre-starting, um, like I, at the beginning we had them choose a topic or a species or a, a page and that's, um, not the best it takes them forever and they choose the wrong ones just because they don't know wikipedia that well or that what would be a good one so now i just give them a list i tell them you can choose this or talk to me like sometimes they have ideas 
So there's things to streamline things, but it was actually, I kind of did it on the fly a little bit. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's great. The, <laughs> the Math 100 project took a little, little bit more time. We went through so many different iterations of projects that, and then this one wanted to come up with something a little bit more broad that would interest you know, especially since we moved online, we have students from different islands too. You know, what what's something that we want them to learn about that is interesting and has potential for no matter where they are. So I would say maybe a semester or longer to develop this project just because of getting ideas for a math class was was a little difficult. <laughs> And I would imagine that particular term project has like five steps. So each of the steps would need to kind of be refined. Yeah, it's it's one of the good things that multiple instructors use this project because I get feedback every semester to make improvements. So that's one of the benefits of having more than one instructor teach using this project. Oh, and Anushka, uh, did you mention that Alyssa was working with you on this? Yes, I started the Wikipedia first and then she joined in and I think it was helpful to just share. Um, I think we also will be present at the, the community college um, thingy. So if you want more SSI? details, come to that. Yep, that one. Um, yeah. And I definitely, you know, the first one definitely time around I did them was definitely not perfect, but, um, and they improved with time, but I think it was still pretty okay at the beginning. Um, once you have the, I, I think the general idea of it in and the steps, then I think it's, it's easy to, um, do, but you got to think a little bit of what you want to, the students to get out of it and what are the parameters and, you know, how much you want it worth and how many steps in between and, so it's not too much, yeah. So it makes sense for them, but also for you from a general, what you want them to get out of it, but also from a grading or point of view. The grading, I have to say, it, it was less than I thought it would be because of the built-in um, commenting. Students are actually pretty good at commenting to each other. So, and just giving feedback. So I just, would give to the ones who didn't have anything you know, or, or missing things in between or they could reach out to me but i i thought that would be a big time um you know issue but it, it was actually not as bad as i thought wow oh wow great thanks for sharing so we want to make this an engaging experience for our participants so if you um have any questions please uh, feel free to unmute your microphone or in the chat if you have any ideas for authentic assessments that you might consider for your classes um, and you need a sounding board um, this might be a good time to bring it up and and share with us and if if um, nobody wants to share or nobody has any ideas at the moment i do have um let me see a few more slides, which will be on the slide deck that I'll share with you, but let's skip back. There are some, if you need it, these are six steps to creating um, an authentic assessment. So if you need help getting started, you can follow these steps. It of course always starts with your aligning with learning objectives or learning outcomes for your course. Um, then move on to writing a few brainstorm sentences out. And from there, breaking up those sentences into the main ideas into a bullet list. Then once you have that list, what do the students, students need to know for each of those bullet items to be successful? And then from there, you can brainstorm on the type of assessment activity that you would, the authentic assessment activity that you would like them to do. And then you can work on developing a rubric. And um, so the, these six steps are just to get started with an authentic assessment. Um, the ones shared by Anushka and Reina are way, you know, polished. Um, so eventually you'll get to that point. But if you're looking for ways to just get started, uh, these are, you know, 
uh, some of the steps that you might follow. So how those apply to the example that I had given in La Lima uh, about the La Lima lessons project. You know, I start with identifying the learning objective, which was to develop a La Lima lesson for week one of your online course. Then I wrote a few sentences about what I want the participant to do. So by the end of the week, the participants will have developed a completed lesson, La Lima lesson for week one on their online course. And a La Lima lesson is comprised of these six parts, and I listed the six parts. Um, then I broke it up into the bullet points, the main ideas. So for the specific, for the La Lima lesson, or yeah, the La Lima lesson, the six parts would be to have a title, introduction, list of learning objectives. Uh, they would compose a section explaining the learning materials, list of activities, and list of assessments. Then what they will need to know, for this particular example, I just detailed one. <laughs> so I just detailed the, for writing the introduction section, what they would need to know. But if you were doing this for yourself, you would probably detail for all of the different items. So for this one, to make a successful introduction, um, it should be brief, it should be appealing, and it should be relevant. Explain the relevance to the student, uh, the topic to the students. And then I brainstorm some ideas um, on what the student or the participant would do. So they'll work within their actual Laulima development site to build and uh, complete a Laulima one lesson introduction section and then i made a rubric from that so the rubric again helps to make it efficient because without the rubric it's not as easy to grade uh, efficiently these types of authentic assessments uh, so you want to make a rubric so again i'll share the slide deck with you um, you can go back and look at the six steps if, if you find them helpful um, and there's also going to be a recording which you can go back and listen to um, if you need to um, pause it and stop it. Um, again, thank you for uh, Anushka and Reina for sharing their expertise um, today and sharing their comprehensive um, authentic activities. Uh, and lastly, there's some resources here. Um, again, the slide deck, Bloom's Taxonomy, if you're not familiar with it, different levels of learning, and also the article that I referenced uh, earlier for this um, topic is very helpful. And very lastly, if you could help us by taking our survey there, um, I'll put the link in chat. Or if you have a mobile device, you can zap that QR code with the camera app and um, be taken to the survey. We appreciate your feedback. And while you're doing that, if anyone else has any um, thoughts or questions, Thank you all for sharing your ideas for um, gaming, for authentic assessment gaming. That was really helpful to hear about the various games that folks have been doing. Speaking about gaming, I, hi everybody, I'm Erin. Um, I was thinking about Blanca's question about what to do with students who quote, are quote unquote on the losing team. Um, and my, I don't know, what I thought about was the games don't necessarily have to be against each other. You could also have it, the student against a task. So then if they accomplish the task, then those are meeting proficiency or exceeding, and those who don't may need additional support. So I think sometimes we always, like I do, I think of games as a challenge against somebody, but it could also be a challenge against myself if that makes sense. Sorry. <laughs> no, that does. That's a really good um, different perspective to think about it. Because, you know, the challenge doesn't always have to be against another person. It could be against a goal, meeting the goal. That's great. Okay, well, if not, uh, we'd appreciate your time here. If you could complete the survey at some point, that's also appreciated. Um, but thank you for joining us today.